From the wilderness of Kodiak Island, Alaska, this is Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier with your host, Robin Bearfield. In a land full of peril and vicious animals, humans are the most dangerous predators of all. When someone brutally murdered the postmistress of Ruby, Alaska, a small village on the Yukon River, the Alaska State Troopers believed they had a locked room mystery on their hands. They suspected one of the villagers of killing Agnes Wright. After all, there are only two ways into and out of Ruby, either by boat on the Yukon River or by air travel on a small bush plane. Neither method of transportation is inconspicuous to or from a village where everyone knows everyone else, and a stranger's presence warrants stares and whispers. Since the troopers heard no credible accounts of a stranger in town on the day of the murder, they began with the premise that one of the villagers committed the crime. But who in this small village hated Agnes Wright enough to beat her savagely and then shoot her? Welcome to Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. I'm your host, Robin Bearfield, and I'm broadcasting from the heart of the Kodiak National Wildlife Refuge on Kodiak Island in Alaska. I am thrilled to announce the release of my new book, Kodiak Island Wildlife. This nonfiction wildlife book is filled with beautiful photos taken by my husband, Mike Muncie. The book describes the biology and behavior of the marine and land mammals on and around Kodiak Island. There's also a section on eagles and a few other birds common to the island. If you would like to learn more about my wildlife book, please watch the trailer. There's a link to the trailer in the show notes and on my Facebook page. I also write wilderness mystery novels set on Kodiak Island, and you can learn more about my novels in my show notes. My books are for sale on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and other online booksellers. Now, back to the mysterious murder in tiny Ruby, Alaska. Ruby, Alaska, with a current population of 166 people, lies nestled along the southern shoreline of the mighty Yukon River in north-central Alaska. The Yukon River ranks as one of the major rivers in North America and stretches 1,980 miles, or 3,190 kilometers, from British Columbia to the Bering Sea. When the river is open, it is a major transportation route, but ice blocks its flow for half the year. The residents of Ruby, Alaska, endure an extreme environment and long periods of virtual isolation. For a few weeks in the summer, the temperature soars to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, or 21 degrees Celsius. But in the winter, the mercury drops to an average temperature of minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 23 degrees Celsius, and at times it hits below minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 37 degrees Celsius. There are no roads into Ruby, and when the ice fills the river, boat travel also is impossible. The flight in the small bush plane to Fairbanks, the nearest city, takes one and one-half hours and is only possible when the weather conditions permit. In 1996, the ice broke up and flowed out of the Yukon River on May 7th. Not only can breakup be timed to a specific day, but it can be timed to a specific minute and second, and the citizens of Alaska bet on when breakup will occur on the various major rivers in the state. I can only imagine the excitement the residents of Ruby and other river towns along the Yukon must feel when the river again begins to flow. Their happiness at finally welcoming spring is short-lived, though. Soon after the ice leaves the river, mosquitoes hatch in voracious swarms. 
in perfect conditions, an isolated village with a population of fewer than 200 people experiences conflicts between its residents. But after a long, icy winter in Ruby, tensions run high and tempers occasionally flare. It's easy to understand why fights break out and gossip boils. But why would one of the residents want to kill Agnes Wright, the well-liked postmistress of Ruby? On June 20th, 1996, around 6.30 p.m., 15-year-old Jeansy Esmelka walked to the post office in Ruby to check on her mother, Agnes Wright, 32. Agnes, the postmistress, usually locked the post office door by 5.30 and drove home to her family. When Agnes still wasn't home an hour after closing time, Jeansy went to the post office to see what was keeping her. When she arrived, Jeansy found the post office door unlocked, and when she opened the door, she saw the horrible sight of her mother's lifeless body sprawled on the floor. Agnes had been beaten, cut, and shot. Jeansy summoned help, but life-saving efforts proved unsuccessful. The village public safety officer contacted the troopers who arrived in Ruby later that evening. Ruby, Alaska, established in 1911, once boasted a population of 3,000 individuals and was an important supply town and port during the Alaska Gold Rush. The dramatic history of Ruby tells the story of boom and bust as well as any gold rush town anywhere. Prospectors first discovered gold on Ruby Creek in 1906, and to this day, gold still can be found near Ruby the largest nugget ever discovered in Alaska, weighing 294.1 troy ounces, which is 322.67 ounces, or 9,148 grams, was found near Ruby in 1998. With the discovery of gold in Ruby Creek in 1906, prospectors and miners flooded the area, dreaming of instant wealth. The town of Ruby grew with businesses providing supplies and recreation to miners who were far from home and learning to survive in a harsh environment. In 1918, Ruby began to decline when many of the young miners and prospectors left to fight in World War I. The town lost several of its business people and their families that same year when they headed south for the winter on the SS Princess Sophia and the steamship grounded on Vanderbilt Reef in Lynn Canal near Juneau. All 343 passengers and crew were lost when stormy seas prevented rescue boats from approaching the vessel before it washed off the reef and sank. In 1929, a fire destroyed most of the business district of Ruby, and a 1931 flood took out the rest of the buildings on the riverfront. By the end of World War II, Ruby, Alaska had become a ghost town until Koyakun Athabascans from the village of Kokorinis moved into the town to take advantage of the abandoned houses. Fewer than 200 people have lived in the village of Ruby ever since. Trooper Sergeant Jim McCann, a well-known investigator to those of you who have been listening to my podcast for a while, headed up a team of troopers and U.S. postal inspectors in the investigation into the murder of Agnes Wright. The murder of a postal employee on duty in the U.S. is a federal offense, punishable by death. The case stumped McCann. Sadly, most murders in small remote villages in Alaska are solved within a matter of hours, if not minutes. Usually drugs and alcohol fuel the violence, and too often the murders involve domestic abuse. The murder of Agnes Wright could not so easily be resolved, though. Agnes had grown up in Ruby and had borne three children. Although separated from her husband, the pair appeared amicable, and according to him at least, they were 
even considering a reconciliation. McCann and his investigators understood violent crimes. They knew the most likely perpetrator was someone Agnes had known well and perhaps even loved. McCann believed at least one, and probably several, of the villagers knew or suspected who had murdered Agnes. But McCann quickly became frustrated when he tried prying information from villagers who did not trust outsiders, especially law enforcement officials. One witness reported seeing Agnes's estranged husband, Joe, arguing with Agnes at the post office a few days before her murder. Joe would be forced to pay Agnes child support if they divorced, and Joe admitted he drank too much at times. Investigators interrogated Joe, but when he produced an alibi and passed a polygraph test, they dismissed him as a suspect. Some of the village children told investigators they saw a stranger in town for two days before Agnes's murder. They described the man as white and approximately 5 foot 8 inches tall, weighing 160 pounds, with long blonde hair tied into a ponytail. They said he carried a brown accordion folder. The children said that when they asked him what his name was, he said Elvis. Police could find little evidence to support this lead and soon dismissed it. At first, villagers did not believe one of their own had murdered Agnes. No one could think of anyone in the village who had ever displayed such violence. Some of the residents told McCann that the murderer must have come from outside the village, and they suggested Abram Walter, a 23-year-old trapper who lived with his parents and brothers in a remote cabin near McGrath, 70 miles or 113 kilometers from Ruby. Walter had been arrested a few months earlier for burglary, but not long before he was scheduled to appear in court in Bethel, his overturned canoe was found on the river near his home. The canoe was discovered on June 5th, and the troopers searched the river for two days, but found no trace of him. Troopers determined Walter had drowned, and they knew his remains might never be found. When one of Agnes Wright's friends suggested Walter as a possible suspect, the trooper who was questioning her said patiently, Ma'am, first of all, dead people don't murder. And second of all, if somebody had just walked through the meanest tundra you've ever seen, he's not going to kill the first person he sees, is he? Troopers searched the river and the area around Ruby, but when they found no evidence or possible suspects, they discounted the stranger theory. Not only did it seem impossible that a stranger could enter Ruby, kill the postmistress, and then disappear again without anyone seeing him or his boat, but why would a stranger kill Agnes Wright? An audit of the post office revealed only money orders and a money order in printer were missing from the building. But why would someone steal a bunch of traceable money orders? And why would a robber beat Agnes before shooting her? Let me take a short break to thank the folks at the puzzle game app Best Fiends for supporting murder and mystery in the last frontier. I appreciate you. I guess nearly everyone has heard of Best Fiends by now. It's a bright, cheerful game designed for adults but appropriate for all ages. The funny, colorful insect characters keep you smiling while the challenging games Focus your mind on the task of solving each level and moving on to the next. If you're not sure whether Best Fiends is for you, download it and give it a try. I bet you will be just as hooked on the puzzles as I am. I've mentioned before how the game both relaxes me and stimulates my brain. It improves my mood and energizes me, even after playing it for only 15 minutes. Spend time with your best fiends and de-stress during a coffee break or for a few minutes before you turn out the lights at night. I just completed level 733. I breathed through the last three levels but struggled with the previous puzzle before I successfully completed it. When I do finally succeed at solving a puzzle, my insect fiends jump up and down and cheer for me. I feel as if I have a pep squad in my corner. 
If you haven't played Best Fiends yet, you must give it a try. Engage your brain with fun puzzles and collect tons of cute characters. Trust me, with over 100 million downloads, this five-star rated mobile puzzle game is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Soon the villagers of Ruby realized that investigators believed one of their own murdered Agnes. Once investigators ruled out Agnes's husband Joe as a suspect, the residents of Ruby began to look at each other differently. Rumors floated, doors were locked, and mothers kept their children inside. Agnes had been a member of the Ruby City Council, and some questioned if her death was linked to rumors of corruption on the council. Others whispered about drug traffickers in town and wondered if she'd caught someone shipping drugs through the Postal Service. McCann also believed drugs were a possible motive and thought it possible that Agnes was killed because in her position as the postmistress, she became alerted to illegal drug shipments through the U.S. mail. One of Agnes's friends said not long before her death, Wright had been worried about something going on in the village and she was too afraid even to mention it to anyone else. Villagers kept shotguns beside their doors and began to wonder who among them had murdered Agnes Wright. It's difficult to imagine a less likely murder victim than Agnes. Neighborhood kids gathered at her house and watched her satellite television. Agnes planned community picnics and games for children. Her friends described her as cheerful with a playful spirit, and she never hesitated to volunteer for community projects. Investigators shook their heads. The murder didn't make sense. After a week and a half of questioning the villagers, McCann and his team of troopers and U.S. postal inspectors needed a break. McCann said he had grown exhausted from repeatedly asking the same people the same questions. He wanted to get out of the village for a while, and he felt the villagers deserved a break from him and his team. He remained convinced the murderer was still in the village, and he believed the villagers knew more than they were telling him. He wanted to give everyone time to think. He planned to fly back to Ruby in a week or two and begin another round of questioning. Before McCann could return to Ruby and resume questioning the villagers, something happened to send this investigation in a new direction. On July 16th, the post office in the small village of Esther, near Fairbanks, was robbed by a man with a gun. The man demanded blank money order slips and then walked out the door. A money order in printer had been stolen from the same post office a few days earlier. The village of Esther is near Fairbanks, 221 miles or 355 kilometers from Ruby. But troopers knew the man who stole the money orders from the post office in Esther must be the same man who had taken money orders and an imprinter from the post office in Ruby, killing Agnes Wright in the process. The crimes were too similar and strange to have been committed by two different individuals. Police discovered a set of keys marked Le Mans on the ground outside the post office in Esther, and they assumed the thief dropped them in his haste to get away after the robbery. The keys matched a vehicle recently stolen in a burglary in Nanana, and troopers put out a radio call to be on the lookout for the vehicle. Within hours, a trooper located the stolen Le Mans and took the driver into custody. The man told the trooper his name was Abram Paul Walter. He was the 23-year-old trapper the troopers believed had drowned when his overturned canoe was found on the river. Walter confessed to staging his death in a canoe accident. He said he then walked several days over the rugged tundra. 
The night before he killed Agnes Wright, Walter camped outside of Ruby and worried about his girlfriend and her finances. He decided he'd send her a money order the next day, but since he didn't have any money to send her, he embarked upon the crazy plan of stealing money orders and a money order imprinter from the Ruby post office. He did not know money orders could be traced. He told investigators he shot Agnes Wright when she tried to wrest the gun from his grip. While relieved to have Agnes Wright's murderer behind bars, Trooper McCann and his team were surprised to learn the identity of the killer. They believed Abram Walter had drowned in a canoeing accident 70 miles from the village of Ruby and two weeks before Agnes's murder. While troopers had immediately discounted Walter as a possible suspect for Agnes's murder, the residents of Ruby had not been so quick to exclude him. And for many, Walter remained at the top of their list of suspects. Agnes Wright's father said from the beginning he'd considered Walter the primary suspect in his daughter's death. He said the troopers found Walter's canoe, but they never found him. And he pointed out that Walter was about to go to prison at the time of his disappearance. What better way to escape jail than to stage your own death? Another villager explained that Walter could have walked from where his canoe was found over the uneven tundra to Ruby within four or five days. The villager told a reporter, somebody from L.A. would probably die out there, but he could do it. It's deceiving to look at a map of Alaska because distances are impossible to gauge. If you study a map of the Yukon River, it appears as though village after village dots its banks as it winds through western Alaska. Look more closely, though, and you will realize large distances separate these small villages. Abram Walter staged his canoeing accident near McGrath and then hiked over rugged tundra 70 miles or 113 kilometers to Ruby. He next surfaced in Nanana, 189 miles or 304 kilometers from Ruby. Esther, where he robbed the second post office, lies 46 miles or 74 kilometers from Nanana and 11 miles or 17 kilometers from Fairbanks. I can't help but wonder how long it took after Walter's arrest before the villagers of Ruby unlocked their doors and unloaded their firearms. Have they ever been able to trust each other again? Most claim they knew all along that Agnes was not murdered by one of their own. But between the time Jean Z found her mother's body and the day the troopers finally arrested Abram Walter, the whispers floating on the breeze in the village nestled beside the mighty Yukon River told a different story, one of suspicion and fear. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thank you to my patrons for your support. Check out the show notes for more information on how you can support this podcast and unlock extra episodes by joining the Last Frontier Club. You can also search for this podcast on Patreon to learn more about the Last Frontier Club. I'll see you soon for the next episode of Murder and Mystery in the Last Frontier. Thank you.